What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Logos Podcast. This is Max. This is Joey. And on today's episode, we've got a dense topic, philosophical, Philosophy. classic logos, classic. taken in old school. We're going to be talking about the huge philosophical figure of contemporary times, uh-huh. Michel Foucault. That simple, guys. If you've never heard of, heard of Michel Foucault, that's okay. Not a lot of people have, but a lot of people are, I think, guided, at least oh, implicitly, yeah. by his ideas. And in fact, Bishop Barron did a recent episode on this uh, this thinker, this yeah, French which thinker. Is really good. But I will say, I'm not calling out Bishop Barron here, but oh, what really? I am saying is that Logos had considered talking about him as well before it's this, true. this this came we're out. On this, and so we're on the same wavelength. We're on the same wavelength. But I think after listening to Bishop Barron, I was like, okay, yeah, we got to do something. Uh, it was yeah. him, and and I remember being struck by him when I studied him formally um, a couple of years ago in my in, uh, in in my philosophy class. But yeah, so I mean, kind of, it, it, what's interesting about Bishop Barron's video? He did this series called "Understanding the Present Moment." Yeah, right. right? And he talked about four big philosophers. The final one of which was Michel Foucault. Yeah, so it was Jean Paul Sartre, which we've covered to some yep. extent. Karl Marx, which we've also talked about. Yeah, that's right, dang. Yeah, and so Nietzsche, uh, Mich- Nietzsche which we haven't spoken much about, maybe in no. a future episode, but then Michel Foucault. So yeah, anyways. Yeah. And what Bishop Barron was saying and what we're going to hopefully demonstrate is that this guy, this philosopher who worked during the 20th century, um, his ideas are hugely influential on our culture today. Yeah. And I think can explain a lot of the chaos that we're finding ourselves in. So understanding what he wrote and why is going to be really helpful for helping us understand the world around us right now, I think. So that's kind of why we wanted to do this episode. So we're going to try to present to you this guy's thought, kind of talk about who he was, some of the major ideas that he had. Yeah. Even though we're not Foucault experts, we should say yeah, that. Yeah, that's a good preface. And yeah, he's, so, yeah. he's like super sophisticated and dense in his writings, right? right? So, And he is he is like, I mean, and he's also relatively, when it comes to the philosoph- his philosophical movement, it's relatively new. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, 30, 40, even 50 years uh, worth of kind of, uh, you know, writings is, is relatively new. And, and I think that's also part of it. It's like the scholars are limited because it's new, but we're by no means uh, scholars. We're not experts. But we have, do have basic knowledge of, of the ideas he presents here. Yeah. So our goal here is to just kind of extract some of the big ideas that he yeah. took away and help you think through them and um, be able to combat some of them, I think, because yeah. we're going to see that he's the source of a lot of problems um, that we find ourselves in the midst of. Before we get into the conversation, what is though, a conversation, though? I just told you what the conversation is going to be. No, about. no, you. Oh, the, before we get into uh, the conversation, oh, that's right. Tell me, dog, what's going on? Lay it on me. We got this thing called a Patreon page. A Patreon page. You feel if me? You go to patreoncom slash podcast, You can become a donor for Logos. You a can donor. support our project. You can, you can support it. You can give us money. You can give us money to help us keep doing. Keep doing what we're doing. What we're doing, <laughs> and uh, we would really appreciate that. We're praying for all of you, obviously, are, regardless actually. of whether you give to us or not. But right. um, we would ap- really appreciate your help. Keep us continue, like help us continue, approve our our setup here, our studio, the quality of our video and audio production. That's going to be super helpful. So it is. we also have Instagram. We also have um, TikTok. Mm-hmm. We also have a website. Wow, Joey, well done. And the links to those things are t- you typically attach those to these. We got, we're on YouTube, so check us yeah. out on YouTube. Subscribe, follow, share, rate, and comment on our stuff. Um, so move it on up, dude. That's that's kind of we got to say that because that's what they pay us to say. That's yeah. We get a lot of money because we're on this thing. You know, as, as sponsored you can, by Jesus Christ, Jesus. always present, guys. If you're ever in need of some help, please consider reaching out to Jesus Christ. Again, that's Jesus Christ. You can reach out to him at jesuschrist.com, also jesuschrist.net, also jesuschrist.org, and he's always present, guys. And that is the sponsor of this video. Thank you for tuning into this uh, to this Logos podcast, and we'll see you later. God bless. God bless. <laughs> God bless. No, okay, so Michel Foucault. I mean, this guy, big time. And and. He was a character. He was a character. And I think you can, and in fact, he's so contemporary that you can find some of his even higher quality interviews on YouTube right now. Um, if you go, if you go and search up Michel Foucault, I will preface by saying, and Joey will probably agree, he is a very interesting figure, um, both positively and negatively. He's a very articulate, intelligent man, but he's also a very dark and kind of nihilistic man. You can tell his exposure and the way he talks. He has a very kind of 
dark demeanor to to his kind of position and um yeah i was talking to we, we brought on dr eric graff right yeah, too, yeah, yeah. Not, not too long ago and i was mentioning he's like hey what are you gonna record on this week and we're like actually we're gonna talk about michelle foucault and he was like i'm sorry if you're having to read his stuff and and i was like oh come on what do you mean and he's like yeah he's like well you know and he was kind of telling me you know he had studied at the university of toronto and um a little bit of biographical um kind of background to, to Michel Foucault. He's a French philosopher. Yeah, so he's and from France. He's, so, he's from France, and um, he had influence in the University of Toronto because of its French descendants. Oh, and So a great. lot of the literature had reached uh, the University of Toronto where he was studying. And Dr. Eric Graff was da- there. Exactly, and he said he'd remember distinctly when he was studying uh, literature, pursuing his, his master's, I think it was, in literature, or maybe doctorate. Of course. He, yeah, why not? I mean, he has yeah. them all, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Um, and so he said he'd been exposed to some of the, the, the rhetoric and the literature that um, kind of Foucaultian people were influencing it's, in this. It's, it's dark. It's kind of twisted yeah. stuff. And so it's kind of reached uh, the the academic level by a wave. And as Bishop Barron uh, was kind of speaking about, and Jordan Peterson has mentioned, and what we would like to say is that in fact these ideas are prevalent, not explicitly perhaps. And you probably aren't talking about. Yeah, you don't probably have a Michel Foucault T-shirt. Yeah, you've probably never but, even heard his name before. Right. Um, but you might be encountering or thinking thoughts that he thought first. Yeah. Um, which is wild. Talking about his biography. Yeah. He was born in 1926. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, what is, I think it's Potier, France, I think is where he was born. I think it's how you, that's how you say that. You're the guy who knows French. I'm, I'm the French man. You know, je parle français. <laughs> All right. And that's about the extent of that. All right. And he passed away in 1984. Oh, really? Yeah. So, Relatively young. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like, like, f- 62. Okay, 62. Yeah, 62. Thanks for All doing right, that math done. for me. Yeah, we're there. Actually, that's not true. That was bad math. It was um, 50. If we do the math here. Oh, this is so embarrassing. I'm not even 58. Trying. I'm just waiting on you. 58, dude. For the record, Eight. I didn't even just attempt that mental math. I could have right. done it had I attempted Look, it, but I just didn't want to. Look, we're philosophers, okay? Yeah, take it easy, d- okay? D- d- math take math it is in our logic is Who our thing. You? Not, yeah, okay, not geometry. But he was like a celebrity, right? Like, oh, big time. He got really famous yeah, yeah, yeah. even in his lifetime. Yeah, and so, yeah, he was, he was big time for, for, yeah, for his time and, and still today. I mean, he's, he's taken very seriously in the kind of intellectual endeavors. He um, comes out of the school of thought of like Nietzsche. Um, Fred, and Fred, Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche, right, um, a German. So he's right. very influenced by him right. and by Karl Marx, right? That's right. Uh, he has he has uh, influences by Karl Marx, and again at the time, the, those are the philosophers: Heidegger, uh, a little bit of Husserl, uh, you know, these these kind of uh, Wittgenstein and Jean Paul Sartre, and all these guys are kind of you know part of the 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 um, a philosophical movement. I mean, there was two. There was one in Europe, what's known as a continental philosophy, and then there's the analytical, which reached um, large parts of like Sweden and Norway and Netherlands, but also reached America. And that's really where kind of the philosophical school of thought in America, the Americas, kind of was influenced by was this analytical philosophy, which takes language serious and studies the kind of construction of, of words Focus and definitions. On words and language, right. especially, yeah. And so, and so kind of, Michel Foucault comes out of this this kind of school of thought, this spirit. So we're going to see that in some right. of his writings, this focus on language, on yeah. discourse we'll talk about. So, yeah. um, okay, what else is important about his life, though, before we start talking about his works? I think it, I think it's also, we, we talked about uh, earlier, I mean, he's a brilliant man. Smart uh, guy. Very, very smart. Articulate, right? Very articulate, um, uh, kind of charismatic. Charismatic. Yeah, that's right. And so I think that was another thing. It's like part of it was he was a smart man, but another part of it was he was very good at speech. He was mm-hmm. very rhetorically attractive. Which you don't get all the time with philosophers. You don't. Right? Like a lot of times you'll get a philosopher who's like can think really clearly, but if you put him on the spot, he's not going to explain it really. Well. Like he he can write a really good yeah. book, but he can't give a public lecture. Right. And this a guy, book. This guy uh, can do both. Exactly. And, and a book forces you to kind of sit down. Yeah, and kind of think about it, and and and, and you have time, that, and right. it's it's slow, and um, it's methodical, right? So Michel Foucault, brilliant man, intelligent, articulate, but he was also psychologically distressed. He was tormented as a kid, didn't have a very good relationship with his father, and we say all this in light of not trying to kind of deconstruct who he was or trying to ruin his reputation necessarily, but these are important things to consider when talking about somebody very, like Michel very. Foucault, and I think you will see through his writings some of the um, effects of this. So he was tormented as a kid, kind of bullied, um, again, a brilliant kid, but not taken serious, I think, for a large part of his life. Had a bad relationship with his father. Um, it affected uh, uh, his, his, yeah, he, he was known to have had a, a poor relationship with his dad. 
um, which could be hard on anybody, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So that also must be taken into account. Studied philosophy and psychology at several French universities uh, where he was asked to attend prestigious college, the, the Collège de France, I think that's how you say it. Uh, so he was a professor of the history of systems of thought. And that's where he actually died in that uh, Collège of France. Um, he was a political activist. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. He protested on behalf of the margin or marginalized groups. Which him will himself, make, which will make sense as yeah, we get into some right. of his ideas. Um, a year before his passing, this was interesting. I found out he actually had accepted a job at the University of Berkeley, Berkeley University in, the, in, California, here, in California. In California. And what he was going to do was on a yearly basis give a lecture there. Um, which obviously he didn't get to do yeah. very often because he passed away shortly before accepting such a role. Um, nevertheless, he also was an active homosexual. Active homosexual, and I've heard that he might have even had a preference for younger, yeah, like, like boys. Yeah. Um, so that's something to be taken into consideration when thinking about him. And then also, wasn't he? I mean, he was suicidal even throughout was, his life yeah depressed. he was institutionalized I mean, um in psychiatric wards on on i think a couple of occasions at least maybe a few more than a couple but uh he was institutionalized yes suicidal heavy drug user drug user huge drug user um and i think it's also important to consider here that i mean he explicitly set out on living uh the full uh, homosexual lifestyle um, so much so that he actually moved into communities that were known for having AIDS amongst them and partaking in the activities that and these that's, communities that's involved. That's how he died, right? He that's ultimately how he died. Contracted AIDS. Um, and it's, it's, a sad, it's a sad death, you know? That's yeah. um, tragic. I mean, the whole, I mean, yeah. Yeah, and so in light of talking about Michel Foucault and considering his ideas, I think it's important that we take this history that kind of, uh, you know, uh, overshadows his existence mm -hmm. that, to be mm -hmm. taken serious. Always, always, always categorizing and qualifying the history of a person within who they are now. Yeah. You yeah. know, but at the same time, yeah, these, these are things to consider. Okay. Um, so here's just a list of a, a few of, so he wrote a lot. Yes. Because he's really smart. But here's just a few of the titles of some of his works. He wrote a title called The History of Madness. Yeah. Right. Where he's breaking down, like, how have people thought about crazy people throughout history? Right. Yeah. Um, he wrote a big book, fancy book called The Order of Things. Which I'm, um, it's said to be one of the most famous or that's popular supposedly books. one of his most influential, right. very dense, very technical, yeah. philosophical, psychological. Yeah. So he wrote one called The Archaeology of Knowledge, which we're going to talk about. Yep. The Discourse of Language, which we're also going to talk about. The History of Sexuality. Mm -hmm. So um, these are just a few of the titles. He wrote one on the history of prisons, too, I believe. Yeah, So and that was another thing. He was a reformer in, in yeah. those ways. Like I, I think like um, uh, mental institutions he wanted to reform, mm -hmm. prisons he wanted to reform. Um, and again, we'll talk about the goods and bads of uh, his attempts at reforming, what that looked like Yeah. Right. Um, when talking about his works. But I think the, par the particular works you said are... are so let's start, yeah, the archaeology yeah. of knowledge. This is one of the works. We want to just extract for you guys a couple of big ideas from this work again it's very dense and very sophisticated and complicated he's very hard to read he is um but yeah. we're going to and i haven't read a whole lot of his stuff yeah um you probably have read more yeah than I so have. i yeah so i was exposed to him i think we did we dedicated about yeah i mean we dedicated several classes to his school i i was exposed to a lot of his primary literature in english to be fair which i hear is not the best translation oh yeah that but makes still sense. but still um i think that what we have so yes i was exposed to his primary literature a while ago and as we were refreshing to discuss this topic a lot of things started coming back mm -hmm. to light and so much so in fact i went to prayer i was like lord how do we talk about how do we talk about this um, and make it kind of uh, yeah stick, but also give it its its due respect and that's also its um, yeah to, to to be honest about this it's never so the archaeology the archaeology of knowledge right off the bat what do we read archaeology what is well, that archaeology that's to like literally that's to dig beneath the surface yeah. right to excavate information like that's what archaeologists do yeah. Michel Foucault is going to want to do that with our ideas, yeah. right? With our forms of knowledge and ideas about the world. Yeah. Um, so he's going to take a, a, a popular idea that's out there in the world. Yeah. And what he's going to want to do, he's, he's like, okay, yeah, everyone seems to accept this idea right now at face value is maybe even common sense. Yeah. It's but the moral norm. It's, it's the, the moral the, norm, yeah. uh, political norm, whatever it might be. What he wants to do is dig down underneath it. Mm. And he wants to, in that process, reveal the different power structures that were at play in bringing about that 
ultimate idea that's now become commonplace among society. Right. And to him, like, that's really the archaeology. The archaeological aspect comes in the diggingness of these. Yeah, the digging like, down behind. And like at certain times in history, certain ideas were, and as time kind of has evolved, certain layers in, in archaeology, right, certain layers of history can have kind of mounted on top of each other. Mm-hmm. And um, and to him, these ideas, what, what we'll refer to oftentimes as discourse or kind of this, this epistemological or discursive formation of words and mm-hmm. ideas coming together to form what we would say truth, he would say more mm-hmm. like power, um, it, these ideas in, inform and in fact demand that man has a certain psychological process, that he thinks about things in a certain way, mm-hmm. and that he acts a certain way, right? So we can talk about more examples of, of those, but like, you know, um, always to keep in mind here that the archaeology of knowledge is studying what is the force behind the ideas being promoted at the yeah. time? Yeah. You know, and who's actually guiding those things? And for, for Michel Foucault, this is going to be one of the most problematic aspects of his thought, but also one of the most constant is that for him, what is most fundamental about the world is power, right? right? And structures and struggles between different groups vying for power. Hmm. So he's going to reject like objective reality, objective truth, and at, at the base level, what he's going to detect beh- behind all the ideas that he's digging behind with this archaeological process is power structures. Yeah. So, okay, some examples of this. Can we think of any examples? Um, one of the examples that I, I wanted to use was like, uh, I don't know, take hospitals, for example. Yeah, right? okay, talk so, to us about that. So hospitals are institutions, mm-hmm. right, that carry certain textbooks that doctors and nurses mm-hmm. and anybody else really working for a hospital has to understand, know, you know, very well um, to be able to carry out the hospital mission well. There's certain textbooks, there's certain journals, there's certain mm-hmm. academic endeavors, lectures, meetings, this and that, whatever. You know, what you can, this can go, list can go on and on. And, uh, but also the hospital institution itself is influenced by a, a higher, like, I don't know, sophisticated scientific program or scientific research or scientific whatever. And in fact, a lot of hospitals are attached to a certain research center, right? And so, but for him, like, in order to understand the things they're promoting, you have to dig deeper into not just the ideas themselves, but the forces implementing these ideas, these textbooks, these journals, these practices within the larger frame of what we would call the medical field. So the, so the, a good example, I think, is he does, and he has this whole work on the history of madness. Oh, yeah, that's a good right? point. But, yeah. he'll, so, but this is a good example for kind of understanding his, his process, his methodology, is he'll say, okay, we have certain people in the world right now who we consider to be mad, right? That's, I mean, mentally yeah. ill, insane, right. in, crazy. Like, so what he's going to do is he's gonna like, okay, well, what if, what happens if we take a look back at history? Like, what did people consider madness to be? I don't know, a thousand years ago, 2000 yeah. years ago in a- some of these ancient cultures. And what he'll, def- what he'll find is like, actually madness had a very different definition in some ancient cultures than it does now. Right. And so he'll, he'll begin to ask the question, well, okay, so why is it that we categorize certain people today as crazy yeah. when they mm-hmm. exhibit, you know, these five or six traits, mm-hmm. whereas those five or six traits that manifested themselves in history didn't necessarily categorize someone as mad. Well, yeah. he said it must be because, I mean, his ultimate conclusion on a lot of these investigations is that it must be because there was some sort of power struggle in the past and a certain group won. Yeah. And another group lost. And now that group has become oppressed. Yeah. And so they've been relegated to the margins, right? Mm-hmm. They've, been, they've been ostracized. And now their status, you know, even in our forms of thinking, in our modes of thinking, their status as crazy- is, is the, Are the winners. Are, well, yeah, well, the, the yeah. people who we consider mad or crazy, these would be the losers, oh, right? Yeah. Right, right, right? These would be the people who, who lost some power struggle back mm-hmm. in history and are now, even in our very- even when I think that someone's crazy, that's kind of me oppressing that person. Yeah, looking lesser, and and they have to prove their worth now. Yeah. Right, and so like the archaeology, again, going back to that image, right? So you're building, you're stacking on top of each other different layers of ideas Mm -hmm. for him would be like the archaeology of knowledge here. And so like what happens is, let's say the the madman, right, or the mentally ill, um, there's a group of, of, you know, medical professionals that say, no, this is an illness. Mm-hmm. Boom, truth stacked there. What happens is this person is now oppressed, mm-hmm. right? The bottom person is now oppressed and the doctors are on top. And then you get that over a level of time, a level of history, you know, and what you have now is, wait a second, 
why are these winners the controllers of reality? Right. Why are these guys that have been telling us, for example, I don't know, the mental ill, the homosexual, the uh, yeah, whoever, why are they telling us that we can't live this way? Isn't yeah. this just a social construction anyways? It's a, so, it's a construction, right? It's, right. A, it's the result of a power struggle. Right. It doesn't reflect our categorization of certain people as mentally ill does yeah. not reflect anything real about reality. Yeah. It's merely an arbitrary result of a power struggle that took place at some point in the past or, past, or multiple power struggles, right, right, that have been building up over time ultimately resulting in the world that we see right now. And I think... And so I think, this is the idea. Right. right. So when we talk about the archaeology of knowledge, or what Foucault seems to be talking about, and uh, archaeology of knowledge, is that um, ultimately the truths at play, what we would say the universal truths at play, truths, yeah. right, at play um, are dominant because by at the cost of others. Yeah. Right? And so now it's the duty of the oppressed to kind of win this ideological mm -hmm. war that's been going on and to kind of express themselves and surmise and become now the revolutionaries, the reformers of this, of this level of fact. And I don't know if he uses the reform language, yeah, I mean it, but, but, but it certainly at least implies that the power struggle is real and one must be conscious of it in his discourse and his dialogue yeah. with others and encounters with other. Um, right? So can we think about this pattern of thought showing itself in today's popular culture anywhere any examples you can think of off the top i have one if you can yeah go ahead well just the idea of like okay so me here saying something today like i don't know the nuclear family is a good institution yeah. right that's like that's the natural institute like that's the natural way things should be is like right. families together living together Michel Foucault would take that claim of mine, that generally accepted opinion, and he would want to dig down beneath it. And he would say, that's not actually true. Like, that doesn't actually correspond to reality. No. The reason that people think that today or have thought that at, you know, at certain times in history is because that thought was used by religious institutions, by religious yeah. institutions or certain groups in order to oppress others. Right. right? And so, of course, me... And you'll hear this rhetoric all the time. Of course, you, a white Christian heterosexual man, would say that because it benefits you in some because it's all about power, yeah. right? You Every, don't, yeah, you don't, you don't have to have kids, but everybody else has to have kids because you're the one that's in control. You're the smartest. You're the best. You're the most athletic. Yeah, and you have to, and and, and by by implementing these ideas, by telling them to live this way, you end up on top. So everything is about right. power, even if I'm. Even if I don't even realize it, that's the right. part. So even if I don't even, even explicitly know that by saying, oh, the nuclear family is a good thing, mm -hmm. I'm oppressing somebody, I actually am, according yeah. to Michel. Well, that, he, didn't, he didn't take up that particular issue. Yeah. But that's kind of his thought transferred and influencing the conversation today in the, yeah. in the, in the political world. So um, it's very dangerous. It is. It's, and I think ultimately, you, you, you said this word, and I don't know where else it's been said, and I'm sure it has probably been said i'm not discrediting you but I'm sure i didn't come up with but um i think what it ultimately uh this boils down to and then i think it'd be good to talk about the discourse of language because it kind of just builds this up even mm -hmm. more what it ultimately seems to do is um build up what do you use a hermeneutic of suspicion of suspicion right so it's not until you begin to investigate the different layers of ideas within kind of historical contexts and this is very important um it's not until you begin to investigate these uh these ideas that you begin to actually get to the truth of the matter to the mm -hmm. to the real core of what's going on here which is him, ultimately always power power um but this is important and i do want to make this uh, clarification before we move forward history for him right these layers these eras of existence wouldn't have been um unitary they wouldn't have been um kind of a, a story that are connected continuous right yeah. they're not continuous they're not connected they're they're, they're fragmented Right. And in fact, we would say, I don't know, in the 21st century, we believe this because in the 16th century, this and because of the 12th century, this and the 8th century and 4th century, these universal norms have been held. And today we live by them because whatever. Mm -hmm. He would not have said that. He would have said that ideas, this archive, right, this archive of knowledge, this, this, this kind of coming together of combined information and ideas have been expressed differently at different periods of history. Mm -hmm. And we need to be conscious that not everything that we hold now as you know universal is applicable because that hasn't always been the case ideas morality things have evolved throughout time yeah right um and so i think it's important to contextualize here about what we're talking about like it ultimately what it does is it forces you 
to look at everything with distrust, to look at ideas and truth claims as something seeking for power and influence. It's real. I'm thinking about it right now from his, it's an inability to receive. Yeah. Mm. It's, I have to, I have to dig, I have to take control. I have to dig down and be sus- suspicious of everything I'm being presented with. Wow. Okay. Before we go on to talk about his second, one of the, his second big works on the discourse of language, I think it'd be helpful. Um, Jordan Peterson made a video talking about Foucault. Right. And he said, this is a great way to kind of interpret Michel Foucault. Is he's oh, actually, I just want to say, I heard a lot of people, or I read a lot of the comments on this video that were like, he doesn't know anything about it. Why is he talking about it? He has no idea. Okay, so here's the thing. Like, first of all, it's not nice to discredit somebody just because um, you, th- you don't like them or whatever. Yeah. But like, Jordan Peterson is a very well-read man. He's and, read Michel Foucault. Okay, and he's, he's the most read author, for example, at the University of Toronto. Okay, so like, I don't know. It's a lot, I saw a lot of critiques and I was like, wait, what? Like, where is this coming yeah. from? Is he coming from a good place? Is he right about everything? No, but he also says he's not an expert in it. Right. But he has expressed. Anyways, I just want to kind of preface it before you say yeah, that. Yeah. So this is, this is a way that he kind of interpreted Michel Foucault. He said he's a Marxist. Yeah. Right. But he transfers the Marxist idea. So Karl Marx viewed everything, all of reality, all of history through the lens of the struggle between the rich and the poor. Right. Right. Everything for Karl Marx was about this class struggle. Mm hmm. For, for Foucault, everything is about a struggle for power, but it's not necessarily between economic classes. It's just between oppressor and oppressed. Mm. So everything for him, he's going to view this through the lens of at base, once you dig behind everything, you're going to find this primordial power struggle between oppressed and oppressors. Yeah. And I think that's a helpful way of of thinking about him as we as we move forward. Cool. So the discourse of language this is um, another major work of his, and we're going to talk about a few of the ideas yeah. that show up in it. First, I want to start by uh, quoting him, actually, okay. just really quickly. There's a quote here that I think will kind of shed light on, on, this on is his main defining idea. defining discourse, right? Yeah, yeah. So, this is, uh, so what is discourse? Discourse of language, what is discourse, right? Discourse means you have a range of statements that provide a language with the way of talking about something. Okay, it provides a language with a way of representing knowledge about a particular subject matter at a given historical juncture. Again, thinking about this theme, certain ideas are expressed within certain historical contexts here. Okay, at those said junctures, I'll take an example here. You, um, I think the example would be like, okay, in in 2022, somebody having an exchange with the president, okay, is going to talk about certain things, certain laws, certain agendas, certain ideas, certain projects. We intuitively know, let's say if I go to this dinner and sit in here with the president, right? Um, I intuitively know where he stands on things. Pretty public. He's, he represents a certain party. You know, you may or may not like him or her. Nevertheless, our exchange, right? Our, the language that we're used amongst each other mm-hmm. is creating what he calls a discourse, right? It's more of an event taking place amongst him and I that enables certain ideas to predicate and represent the dominant ideas of the time. It's a bit abstract. Yeah. But talk us through it. If I, me and me, let's say, for example, me and, and President whoever, right, are sitting here talking about something, I have to, in a certain way, agree with the things that are he, he is saying because of who he is. Yeah. So right. you're going you're gonna to use certain words, Mr. President. Yeah. Right? You're going to address him in a certain way. Shake his hand a certain way. Right. You know, maybe even tilt til my head or get up or do these kinds of things. But the whole idea behind what we're doing is to create an event of discourse, right? To, 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 to make something happen that defines something, right? Okay. So the way that I act and I do things. To, to him is going to define how somebody else has to act and do things when he's with him. Right. So, right. So I think when you, when you come to the president, let's say you're having this encounter with president Biden or, or something, yeah. and um, you're using very particular words and gestures and phrases in your interaction with him, you're really what you are is you're conforming to kind of a system, right? Yeah. You're conforming to, a system that this discourse, this interaction actually continues to build up, right? Right. This is how integrated into that system of this governing system of norms and even words that yeah. are that proper and you know, situated to this context. Now you're reinforcing that system so that other people are going to have to be integrated into it as well. Right. The way we exchange, the way we use language and language, I don't think it's just limited to words. I think it's limited by expert. It's, it's also informed by expression. Oh, yeah. So right. Body language. Right. Stuff and, like that. and so the way that this discourse, this event takes place 
and what happens really ultimately is that we categorize and give perception to reality. And we, const- we construct exactly. reality, right? So like through, through our very words, through the words that we use um, and through the discourses that we're a part of, these events that yeah. we're a part of, we actually give shape to reality. And we expect that everybody else conform themselves to this comportment, to the way that we act, to the way that we think, the way that we say, right? Um, and so the discourse of language, ultimately, the discourse, simply put, I think too simply even, is describes an event that enables these prominent ideas to arise and to build certain standards by which everybody else is now called to conform to. Right. So, right. W- so what is the, co- knowing Michel Foucault's train of thought, what's the consequence of this? This means that the words and phrases and discourses that we're accustomed to being a part of today, they were constructed by oppressors, right? right? Those who are in, those who won some primordial power struggle. Right. It's their words, it's their language, it's their phrases and discourses that have become the prominent ones into which we have to kind of be integrated and submit ourselves to today. And therefore, yeah. by mm. being asked to use certain language, I myself am being oppressed. Right. Right. I have to, I have to submit myself to this guy's agenda, even if I don't like it, or even if I do, whatever. Like I have to do it. And so, like, and that's based off, for example, that's based off of a war that was won two hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, to him, going to back to archaeology, like digging deeper, how did this guy come in power, and why do I have to do what he tells yeah. me to do? And so society tells me to do this. For him, it would have been. Well, it's based off of this historical event at the time, but that no longer applies because Mm -hmm. today we live in a different realm where that's expressed differently, right? So I know Michel Foucault was particularly interested in even digging down behind the meanings of words that are used in like medicine and psychology, right? right? So he was really, I mean, he was questioning like objective scientific truth and like trying to show this is actually not objective yeah. science. This is the result of some power struggle. And now that's why we have these categories, but you can extrapolate, you can see this in today, in today's world, right? Yeah. So, um, our, in our woke culture, if I say something today, like, okay, there's these two categories that correspond to reality and that's male and female. Yeah. Right. Someone who's thinking like Michel Foucault would think would say, okay, actually those two categories don't reflect the like the fact that those are common today and we use those words like male and female we use that those words in our discourse that's not because they correspond to anything out there in the world right that's just the result of a power struggle that's taken place and now op- the oppressors have won the power right. struggle and established their own forms of discourse established their own language so language itself is a reflection of a power struggle and it continues to keep certain people down, right? Yeah, because that's the thing. Like, so who ultimately suffers? Well, it would be people, discourse. the subjects, who, the poor subjects. Yeah, and and, you know, and, and this example right. would be people who feel like they don't fit into the category of male, male or female. Right. right. So this is what we're seeing today. Right. Like these categories aren't sufficient, and and all this stuff. So yeah, right. hopefully it's it's clear how how influential. Michel Foucault. And I think that that's important too. To, and I guess I wanted to say like the person who suffers is, is, is the one or the poor person is the one who ultimately suffers. The subject in this case is the one suffering. Why? Because it's the event of discourse that forces men and women to be defined in a certain way, mm-hmm. right? Rather than actually allowing them to, in this, in this, in this context, create their own reality, mm-hmm. right? Rather than submit themselves to whatever the, the quote unquote norm would have been for, for Michel Foucault. Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind because he would have taken this serious, like a discourse to him would have been serious because it impresses upon us a certain, again, going back, a certain psychological process, but also a certain physiological response to the, whatever the prominent idea of the time mm-hmm. may have been or is. Um, but again, this is, this is, the, this is the, the, the kicker, really. It's like it's a, it's a, it's a power struggle. And I know we're going to keep talking about that, but I think, I think we, can't talk, we can't say that enough. Yeah, and it's, it's, so, work. it's so present it's, in it's him really, and today, right? right? Um, and so and, and, and in light of this, the, the discourse, one of its, one of its roles is, um, and it takes on a different role, actually, when it's organizational. Right. So it's one thing if me and president whoever are having a meal, but it's another thing if president whoever is having, you know, dinner with king or queen or president, whoever else, that sets a different precedent. 
right? Like if doctors are talking amongst nurses and doctors, that sets a different precedence at, at the level which they operate by. Yeah, organizations like, have their right. own proper language right, and right. words and phrases that they have to kind yeah. of conform to. And I kind of want to end with this quote so we can go yeah, on this, to the next this one. This quote looks good. It looks like right? pretty clear. It's also by uh, Michel Foucault here, and it writes, um, in every society, the production of discourse is at once controlled, selected, selected, organized, and re redistributed according to a certain number of procedures whose role it is to avert its powers and its dangers to cope with chance events, to evade its ponderous, awesome materiality. And I think ultimately for him, like, the fa yeah, like, like we live in a world of like kind of chance and I can't remember exactly. I remember I was talking about this in class, but I'm going to try it here. Like we live in a world where like things happen by chance and the fact that we are trying to give and use certain expressions in our, in our, in our experience with reality is an attempt to define it. It's an arbitrary attempt to impose order upon what is at base really just chaos. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so, um, and so I think that's really what's a discourse of language. Succinctly put, it's an event that demands that we submit ourselves to the prominence of ideas in that event, right? Or events collectively, if you will. There's both the events, particular events, but there's also the discourse that's kind of more connected in that sense and influences in a certain way that's more powerful than others. Um, cool. So that's a little bit of the discourse of language there. Yeah, okay. So we covered archaeology of knowledge a little bit on its basic terms. We covered the discourse of language on its basic terms. And now we have the history of sexuality, which I'm excited to hear about. And um, after having read some, it's freaking, it's live, live action. Well, so th this is a very prominent one today. And again, the, the theme is very similar. Um, he wrote two works, a history of modern sexuality and a history of ancient sexuality. But again, what is he doing? He's, it's this archaeological methodology, right? He's trying to understand our current, our societal, our society's current norms for sexual behavior right. by digging beneath them, looking into history, looking at the way that um, ancient cultures practiced sexuality, and then ultimately showing that there's no real standard, there's no real norm. Mm. Everything again is just about power struggles, right? right. So he and it, the, what's particularly interesting to me is he. Um, did a study of the ancient Greeks, right? So we, we venerate the ancient Greeks as very wise, as having... Some come, of them. Some of them, that's right, some yeah. of them. Like Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, these oh, guys yeah. we, we look to a lot in the classical tradition. And they, it's from... Seneca, by the way, if one of our professors is listening. He's okay. a big fan of Seneca. Sorry. And then out of that tradition comes something like the natural law, right? So, and the natural law has been adopted in the church's language, right? Right. So... So, okay, Mich Michel Foucault, he, he's examining those societies and saying, he's saying, look, like the ancient Greeks, they like homosexuality was very prevalent in their society. Right. And he documents this and he finds evidence for it. He's like, it was not uncommon for men to be sleeping with boys. Or right? with each other. Or with each other. Right. So, um, and so he's going to use that piece of evidence to say, here was this reputedly wise people who had this norm. Right. Now we have different norms. So there is no real standard. There is no real norm. There is no real nature to sex or to sexuality. Right. It doesn't have a real purpose. The norms surrounding sexual behavior are just determined by those who are in power. Mm -hmm. Right. So he's going to say he'll, he'll ultimately attribute our current ideas about sexual propriety to probably Christianity and its dominance for in, in history. On or the science. Stage. He took science, the scientific realm science. serious, right? Yeah, you're right. So like biologists um, uh, would say, hey, this and this and this, therefore you're a male, this and this yeah. and this, therefore you're a, you know, a homo sapien sapien or, mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be. Um, but to him it would have been like, no, that's just, again, the dominant force being mm -hmm. exerted on this particular field. So that's kind of like the, that's kind of like the main theme of a history of sexuality and that's kind of the attempt that he's trying to make in in writing that book is basically to show that there is there are no objective standards everything is arbitrarily constructed by force different forces vying for power hmm. and so sexuality also the history of sexuality here is the the um the kind of expression of those ideas at particular times yeah right exactly yeah so He's been, some of his thoughts in this work have been particularly influential on a more contemporary author named Judith Butler. Mm. Judith Butler wrote a book called Gender Trouble. Yeah. And she's one of the real pioneers behind the um, 
the transgender movement and ideology, especially in America. Oh, wow. So um, she is constantly referencing Foucault and his thoughts. Mm. And she's, she's right there in that same kind of line of thinking is that we don't have real access to objective reality. We right. can't say anything true about the world, about sexuality, about men and women. Sure. And so our sexual norms are the way that we typically think about things are just the arbitrary constructs and result of different power struggles that have gone on in history mm. really that have oppressed women and then or even eventually people who don't fit into the gender binary or something sure. like that so um yeah i mean foucault is incredibly influential in a lot of the transgender ideology that we see today in in our society so that's why we got to be cognizant of his of his thinking yeah um so that's those are the three kind of big works we wanted to talk about. Yeah. So now we've already kind of shown our cards on what we think of him, but let's kind of, t <laughs> let's kind of take a step back and maybe just evaluate what we've seen, what we've talked about, talk about, did he get anything right? Like, is there anything commendable about his philosophy? Mm -hmm. And then what is it exactly that is super problematic with it? So let's right. start with the, this. And this is generally, this is fair to do with all philosophers who you encounter, yeah. right? You want to try to extract what you can from them because generally the reason that people get popular is because they're saying something that's resonant, that's resonant, that's true, right? Yeah. And maybe even true. So, mm -hmm. so what do we see in Foucault? What's good about him? Um, to keep it brief, I think one of the things that we see in him is kind of an intellectual honesty, right? He refuses to be just part of the norm of society. He is, be, wants to be beyond the categorizations that mm -hmm. power for him would have been kind of submitting the world to, um, he wants to deal with things. He wants to think about things. He wants to analyze and be critical of things. And there's something there's something powerful about that. I think you read of any person, the saints, the patristics, you read um, the mystics, you read the philosophers of the church. Um, uh, you know, I think that's one of the reasons, for example, like Bishop Barron is so popular is because he takes it serious, even if not everybody agrees with it or whatever. Like he's taking these these matters serious. The, and the controversial stuff, right? right? The stuff on the margins, right. like. Like it's kind of uncomfortable to talk about crazy people. It's yeah. kind of un uncomfortable to talk and think about uh, prisoners and like some like sexuality like yeah. this. But so what's commendable about Foucault is that he wanted to go there. He wanted to like, no, let's not just try to like categorize these and then not think about them. What his intention was, right? We can't assume, but he did bring it forth. But I think we have good enough evidence to kind of at least know. Um, some of his intentions. Well, we'll talk about the negative aspects, but yeah. one of the positive aspects I think is his intellectual honesty. Another thing is that he was articulate, as we said earlier. Mm -hmm. um, again, go watch some of his YouTube videos, read some of his stuff. You'll notice that very quickly. He also seems to be taking uh, language seriously um, yeah. and the way that AR articulates and tells us about philosophy or and about I, truth. Sorry. And I want to make a comment on that. So this whole idea of the fact that, he, you know, he said that human beings through our discourse, through our language, we construct the world. Yeah. Right. Um, I think in a certain sense, he's right. And yeah. let, me, let me explain. Okay. Do explain. So in a Christian perspective, from a Christian understanding, like according to the, so God is ultimately the one who constructs the world through speech. Yes. Right. He speaks creation into existence mm -hmm. through the word, through the logos. Yeah. And that's why everything is imbued with intelligibility and mm -hmm. rationality. Man, when we speak, yeah. when we have dialogues, when we engage in discourse, I think we truly do participate in kind of God's act of creation in and through the word. And the reason I say that is think about this. If you have a child, you can speak to that child in such a way that you totally shape his world. Mm. So if you tell that child that he's, that he's stupid, right? If you tell that child that he's not lovable, if you tell that, if you, if you treat him with negligence, that is going to really and truly impact that child's world. You can construct a certain world with your words yeah. and force that child to live within it. Now that's a, that's an abuse of this gift of language that we've been given. Yeah. Right. And it, what we need to do is receive creation, receive the world as it's been given to us and then participate in its manifestation and revealing its intelligibility through our own language. This is why speaking the right. truth is, is so important, right. right? This is why lying is so grave. It's because when we lie, we're manipulating reality. We're manipulating in a certain sense, reality yeah. for people. We're custodians of the truth. Yeah. We're responsible for it. And I think actually the, the line that uh, came to mind was to be co-workers of truth mm. as Pope Benedict's, uh, I think papal motto. 
a oh, motto. Really? Yeah, so it's like be co co creators of truth, right? And so in the sense that Foucault's taking language serious in the way that it impacts people and the way that they act and the way that they think, um, I think we also can learn something from that to take the way that we speak, what we listen to, the way that we act, that they inform other people about reality and yeah. they kind of shape the way that we think about things. Um, so, anyways, that's I think another positive. I don't know if you wanted to yeah. add well, something. And just to add, addition. of course, for Foucault, there is no God, right? right so right. every act of language, every act of constructing the world through our language, it only has its source in the person, mm. right? And ultimately in the person's will to power, yeah. right? So that's why for him, this idea that human beings can construct lang construct the world through their language mm. is ultimately comes from this, 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 these power struggles. But yeah. really, I mean, it's amazing that the world has been spoken into existence and in the same in way the that- the beginning was the word. I right, mean, come exactly. On, and the, 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 in the same way that a builder- who's building a church is participating in God's act of material creation. So too, we, when we engage in speech, when we mm. use our words, when we use language, when we paint something, exactly. when we make a piece of music, it's analogous to painting a right. picture or making a piece of music, right? Yeah. It's, it's, we're, we're contributing to the, the um, manifestation of God's rationality, of his glory, mm. of his intelligibility. Right. Which so. he's already imbued with it from the beginning. Yeah. Right? In the beginning, like that, that, that order and meaning was already given to and it. And that has to first be received. Right. Right. Okay. So he took, he took language serious. He took language serious. So that's a good aspect that's of his thought, thing. even though he was wrong. And ultimately. this is one thing you, you pointed out, um, this last one, that I think was, was, is, is fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that he was, he was driven by a concern for the marginalized, yeah. for the mentally ill, for those in prison, for those, uh, for people with homosexual attractions. Right mm -hmm. now, um, you'll have certain commentators say that the reason he was driven by a concern for the marginalized is because he himself was a member of the marginalized. Right. And, and I wonder too, if sometimes it was also to kind of justify his lifestyle. Yeah. So you, I mean, right? these are questions that we can't know for sure. In my own thoughts, I think it's reasonable to conclude that yes, that, yeah. that was the case. But I mean, the church is about this too. I mean, the church wants yeah. to go out to the margins. The church doesn't want to just like forget about certain categories of people. The right. church is universal. That's Pope Francis is one of exactly. big models, right? Go out to the margins and with, exactly. deal with the poor and the difficult situations. I think, yeah. So that's nice. that's commendable in Foucault. But I think what's commendable kind of stops there. So what are the yeah. what are the biggest problems with Foucault? And we've already mentioned a lot of them, but just to kind of rehash them and and double down on the problematic aspects of his thought that we see. I think I think ultimately, at at one of the the root issues here, um, and I think one of the reasons that I personally wanted to talk about this subject um, is that I see in the world you can uh, this this hermeneutic of suspicion in everybody. Everybody distrusts and hate everybody. Hates hermeneutic everybody. like a lens, right? Yeah. Like hermeneutic a lens. is a way to understand things. Yeah. Right? Hermeneutic, simply put, is a way to understand things. The way we understand everything is to be distrustful of it. For Foucault, yeah. To be, to be untrustworthy of people, of things, of language. And I think in Foucault's thought, this kind of spirit of untrust that you see in, you know, this nihilistic, what I call nihilistic kind of view of reality that, that modern man suffers with and mm -hmm. is possessed by. Yeah, oh, constantly. Right? Um, I think that's that's one of the large problematic because we would take it um, in, in the in the Thomistic tradition, in the Catholic tradition, in the Aristotelian, in the Western civilizations tradition of um, of truth that uh, it's something to be trusted at least on the sensual level, like mm -hmm. the, the intuitive level. We can sense that we've talked about this a lot. We can sense things. We can see things. So uh, uh, on the very beginning, unlike Descartes, unlike the modern theology and contemporary uh, f uh, philosophers, I'm sorry, and onward, we actually trust the appearances of things to a certain to a certain extent. Obviously, mm -hmm. we trust people. We assume the best of things. Mm -hmm. We we uh, we try to be people of hope, people we, of faith, with people right. of faith, even on a natural level. Right. Like you say something to me, I I believe you. Yeah. And so for for Foucault, however. There was suspicion, hermeneutic, mm -hmm. uh, what, what Joey or whoever calls the hermeneutic of suspicion. And I think that's one of the large problematic things with it. And we can't live like that. Nobody actually ever lives by not trusting everything, I think. But, but the logical progression of holding such a view leads to a life like Foucault's. Ment and mental, mental, illness. mental illness. That he maybe couldn't have held because it's a kind of a but, – but still his way that of, of acting out – kind of was informed to a certain extent. Nietzsche too yeah. ended his life in an insane asylum, right? I think so. I think it's right. He was going he was going mad. So there's some there's clearly some consistency between their philosophical worldview and the their life. The mental issues that they ended yeah. up having. Not I've, to say that that's completely the only cause. Right. right. And because of that too, I think uh, succinctly put, um, it also kind of 
disregards, doubts, neglects objective truth. Yes, because so for them, truth, <laughs> truth, truth would have been uh, created, not something to be discovered, right? So yeah. I think it's another thing here. Um, and going back to like this, this archival, this uh, archaeology of knowledge, it's like truth at best has been a dominant expression. Mm-hmm. That's it. Like it's a mm-hmm. forceful thing on, on certain people. I mean, I don't know. Is there something else you talked about? I think you had mentioned uh, that like the, the Marxist influence in yeah i did so i mean it's one so jordan peterson really doesn't like foucault he thinks he's brilliant and he thinks there's things to be gained from especially that book the order of things yeah but he's kind of he says one of the marks of foucault's kind of despicableness is the fact that after world war one world war two after the horrors of marxism and maoist china and stalinist russia foucault was really the only public intellectual left he's like still embracing marxist ideals so like mm. even all those terrible consequences didn't dissuade him from being like, oh yeah, Marxism is so like I, he so he kind of he takes Marxist ideals which are diabolical and re re kind of encapsulate encapsulates them in this dialogue Sorry, between oppressor and oppressed. <laughs> um, so that's that's problematic with him. And then I was just going to say something else. What were we talking about before that? Uh, um, we were talking about uh, truth as something that's created and discovered hermeneutic of suspicion yeah doubting um, of objective truth man it was really profound i'm sure it was joey i'm but sure it was it'll come it's to gone you. it's gone it'll come to you maybe in the next episode I'll um i think another thing too to talk about negatively put i guess you already kind of talked about it here is that like hierarchies of values categories political systems economic systems social systems religious systems all these things are really nothing yeah, they they don't reflect anything true no. in the world. Um, whereas obviously we would say that's not the case. Uh, the, the, that's not the case. We don't live by that. We, they might be flawed. Yeah, they, they, certainly they're wounded. They're flawed. They're imperfect. We love imperfectly as human beings. Um, but also there's a level to which we all operate by some level of value, which we take seriously. Be yeah, it. if you didn't, like yeah. hierarchy, of val- like hierarchy just means sacred order. Mm. And you can't operate in the world without valuing some things above other things, right? If you d- if you try to operate that like that, you'd never even get out of bed because you, get, you, you don't even have motivation to do anything without pursuing some good, yeah. which you perceive to be better than what you have now or like right. something worth desiring. And for yeah. Foucault, like there is no real hierarchy of value out there in the world worth pursuing. It's all just arbitrary categorization that we, mm. that is a result of these powers. Right. Shortings. And the values are, um, manifested by the prominent figures of the time to the exclusion of those in the peripheries. Right. So values are built off by the, if you will, the elite, mm-hmm. whereas the, uh, the oppressed are kind of pushed to a side and don't fit within the category of what we would call values. Yeah. Um, and to him, that's kind of, it's negative. I mean, it's that's not a good a way to, to live life. That's not a joyful. That's not a hopeful way to live life. Um, not everything is perfect, uh, and there's many systems that are in fact corrupt. And I think and they can, do marginalize they people. Do. So that's why we need to be constantly yeah. like reforming, check, checking, checking ourselves, evolving, and but not completely overturning no. and not completely right. doubting and dismantling. And I think that's one of the the uh, the, the, the fundamental issues with with um, somebody like Foucault and Marx and Jean Paul Sartre and Nietzsche. It's like you got to overthrow this will to power. You got to overthrow right. the power structure. Which is why you see right th- you think th- see things today like defund the police, like yeah. just overthrow everything, just get rid of every system because it's just all an expression of some power structure and i need to express myself how i want to express get rid myself. of marriage and the nuclear family right yeah. like all these things it's just it's um it's not good and so. so ultimately what it causes it seems to me is kind of this war amongst social groups like uh which you see and Today, unfortunately yeah. Uh, particularly in the, in the um, American political uh, structure is, is a deep, deep, deep hermeneutic of suspicion mm-hmm. against everybody and anything that doesn't agree exactly by the way that you do. Therefore, I must hate them. And it causes a lot of disunity in families. It causes a lot of disunity in institutions. In our political, uh, in our political discourse. And so it's like, okay, w- okay, so none of this must mean anything if everybody's just fighting about everything. We must, th- then, then maybe Foucault is right. Maybe everything should be, everything is about oppressor and oppressed Mm -hmm. and should be kind of in this uh, combative thing um yeah so guys we we, we're here trying to cover michel foucault profound thinker um you know of of the 19th 20th so i guess 20th century 20th 20th, 21st century um 20th century i guess 20th 20th century yeah that's just 20th just just 20th century and so um but 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 in light of his work 
We also have to keep in mind his life, his context, what he's trying to do, and what actually happened due to his ideas. And that's really the reason why we wanted to talk about him is because we see the effects of so how some of these ideas are taking place in the world today mm -hmm. through any, you know, you name any any sort of um, function, and you'll see that you, you look at any discourse, if you will, um, taking place in the world, and you quickly see that uh, Foucault's ideas are in some ways uh, the ones that are um, guiding the conversation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, implicitly. You yeah. Know. So, I mean, and that's, yeah, exactly. That's why we like doing episodes like this, talking about the history of ideas like this, because right. when we look at the world and see just the craziness around us, it's really, a, it's really scary. And it's really easy to just say, oh my gosh, everything's falling apart. This is all just utterly unintelligible and I don't understand any of it. Mm -hmm. Well, when you understand a thinker like Foucault, then you can look at the world around you and you can be like, oh, I see, like, I see where some of this is coming from. Mm. And now I can understand things and, um, and I, you don't have to be afraid of it. You can, you can kind of, right. you can kind of know, um, to a certain extent. So yeah, hopefully you learned something in this episode. Um, I don't know if I'm going to go recommend reading Michel Foucault. Feel free to, if you want to. I don't think it will be very fun. It would it certainly won't be uh, peaceful or joyful or hopeful. And I think that's the last message I want to leave you on, you yeah. guys on. Um, some of this can be pretty hardcore, all right, pretty dark. Mm -hmm. um, but always remember, as we do, our Lord Jesus Christ promised us salvation, promised us eternal life, promises us, lives amongst us even to this very second, is guiding um, discourse. And he is the true word. He is the true word, unfolding himself, not unfolding himself, revealing himself to man once and for all in the incarnation. And still today we get to partake in that love to the Holy Eucharist, through sacraments, through living a life of purity and holiness. And so, guys, that's ultimately the message here. Foucault, interesting figure. Let's pray important. for Foucault. Let's yeah. pray for Michel Foucault. Uh, and let's pray for all of those who have been influenced, and let's pray for all, us, too, to grow in holiness, to grow in, in truth, and, and be uh, co-creators, co right? Co-creators. Co-creators uh, of truth. So, that's it. Guys. We're praying for you. Yeah, we are. Pray for us. Thank you for tuning into this. It's National episode. Vocations Week. Okay, dude, I'm trying to end the episode, bro. Jeez. Be a priest. <laughs> be a religious sister. <laughs> or be a holy family. Be a holy family, a holy parent. We need holy parents. Ho the holiest parents. But if you're thinking about going to the seminary, think harder and then just do it. <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> Boy, that was crazy. All right, guys, as always, God bless.